happy Tuesday. Hello, this is, uh, I want to welcome all to the Data Science Coast to Coast um, series session today. Thank you for joining us. This is our third session in the series. My name is David Monjo. I serve as the Executive Director at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and I'll be moderating today. Slide two. The Data Science Coast to Coast series is hosted by six data science institutes distributed across the country. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from these institutes who plan today's and our previous sessions in these series. Kyle Cranmer at New York University uh, for the Center for Data Science, Angela Wilkins at Rice University uh, at the Ken Kennedy Institute, Chris Mensel at Stanford leading the Data Science Initiative. Jing Lu at Michigan uh, leading MIDAS, the Michigan Institute for Data Science. And Sarah Stone the, at the eScience Institute, University of Washington. This group convenes regularly to build a community in service of our shared mission to accelerate data intensive research and education on and beyond our campuses. The seminar represents a first step towards advancing this mission by inviting speakers to reach a wide audience across all six of our universities at one time, as well as data science experts and enthusiasts nationally. Slide three. In the fall, two previous speakers presented their work and commitments to data science research and teaching in traditional research disciplines and in support of a more data enabled and just society. Their talks are available at the URL shown, which we'll put in the Zoom chat as well. Slide four. This coming spring, the Data Science Coast to Coast series will feature faculty and postdoc scholars pursuing synergistic research among our six universities, along with two other universities, one of which is announced already, the Institute for Data Intensive Engineering and Science at the University, uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And we'll be announcing the other universities soon. So we looked back, we look forward, now let's focus on today. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Jean Holm, Deputy Mayor for Budget and Innovation for the City of Los Angeles. I truly thank you, Jean, for being with us today, given all that you're managing at this historic time in our city, this week when the vaccines are going to major cities like Los Angeles. As Deputy Mayor, Jean works at the cross-section of civic innovation, open data, and education. Her work includes reducing homelessness, improving digital equity technology innovation with data and analytics, and through public and private partnerships. Early in her career as a senior consultant with the World Bank, Jean worked with governments throughout the world to build robust open data ecosystems and to ensure transparency. Jean's leadership in open data and transparency and her commitment to civic innovation is captured well in something that she said when she assumed her new role as, as um, deputy mayor after serving in Los Angeles as chief data officer. Said, quote, at a time of unprecedented challenges for our city, we're going to zero in on steps to inject greater equity and efficiency into city services by closing the digital divide, streamlining our operations, and reforming processes. Meeting that charge goes hand in hand with what we need to do to spur our economic recovery, strengthen our work on sustainability, open data, and transparency, and improve digital and financial literacy. As we face the challenges from this pandemic head on, we in Los Angeles will be continued to guided by the principles of equity and justice to create opportunities for all. Welcome, Jean. Thank you so much, David. And I appreciate everybody's time today. I know there's so much going on in the world. And for those of you who've been affected by COVID, whether that's being sick or somebody you know who's been sick or who has died or somebody who's had their job impacted, I, my heart goes out to you. I hope you'll be well and safe this holiday season. And um, thank you for, for taking the time to get together today. Yeah. 
I do want to just mention one other thing is I'm also a professor at UCLA and have been for 25 years. So I appreciate the connection between data science in the civic space and the academic space. And you'll see some of that thread in what I'm going to talk to you about today. So feel free to um, you know, ask questions. We'll have an energetic chat afterwards. Um, I'll just take you on a little bit of a journey of what we've been doing in Los Angeles and how we are using data to better inform how we address equity and, um, and work at, in the City of Angels. So first of all, let me just start the conversation with our, our new freshly minted open data site. Um, so you can get to all of the data at the city of Los Angeles through our data.lacity.org site. We try to put things in context here. So for those of you who are data scientists, it's great. We have open APIs for all of our data. We have data that's published on a, on a regular basis, but we also have data that's published in near real time, like our 311 data that's updated every few minutes. And we also really uh, focus on the stories, like the context around the data. Data by itself is useful for data scientists, but data in context is really useful for more people and for businesses. So you can see here highlighted a few of the things we've been working on just recently. Uh, and I'll talk about some of these today. A lot of it's around COVID, around digital equity, health and wellness, and uh, a lot around food uh, security as well, because it has suddenly become an even bigger issue um, LA, while we are a vibrant economy in many ways, LA County is one of the most impoverished counties in the country. Um, there's just a lot of, uh, of inequity. There's very wealthy people in Hollywood, and then there's very poor people on the east side in South LA. So part of our job is to figure out what policies can be better informed by data to improve that equity. And, and part of that really gets into looking at issues of data around disaggregation, around uh, understanding the nuances and, and putting them in context with the stories. I just wanna give you a, a quick note about some of the things we did as we moved into a contactless remote workforce. So back in March when most cities were starting to shut down, a lot of the um, ability for people to be kind of you know, out in public uh, and, and making sure that we were able to control the virus which is the situation we're in again. Um, we moved our city workforce virtual. So we have about 50,000 employees at the city of Los Angeles. It's a very large city, as you all know, 4 million people, 500 square miles. Um, we speak 220 languages, so it's a pretty diverse city too, which causes a interesting uh, challenge on our social media and our websites. So we moved all of our, half of our workforce virtual, about half of our workforce needs to be in place to do physical things in and around the city, repairing streets and filling potholes and picking up trash. So we created the set of resources and policies too, which look at how we protect data and transit, how we make sure people can work from home securely and how we make sure that we have other resources available to folks. As part of that, we started digging into some of the data around what we were trying to do. Um, that related to making sure people had access to all the information about co coronavirus and, uh, and the resources. We stood up resources that we had never, and services that we had never done before. Normally these were done at like a state or federal or county level, but people were going hungry. So we started delivering meals to our seniors in their homes, buying those meals from local restaurants to help support them as well. We did a massive housing of our homeless population, housed about 6,500 homeless folks in the space of about a month to be able to help make sure that we were helping the most vulnerable on the streets of Los Angeles get into a safe place where they could get medical services. And then we just started a whole logistics piece where we started bringing personal protective equipment in so that all the hospitals in the LA area would have an ongoing steady supply. And that has really turned out to be an amazing opportunity. Now, as we're in the midst of another spike and surge, we don't, PPE is not part of the conversation anymore because we just have an ongoing um, import from our, our port of Los Angeles. And then on the other side, we've also been working with, uh, we have a rent moratorium and other things. The data that we've looked at, when we started looking at who's been affected by COVID, started to show us the kind of services we needed. And one of those was to be able to keep people housed when they couldn't pay rent. And so we have a rent moratorium and we've done $110 million in rent support, which goes to the landlords to help offset the costs and support people in offsetting their rent. This is today's snapshot, which, is not a good, good snapshot of the data around coronavirus in Los Angeles. 
This is our public view. And so you can see our numbers are really in rough shape. Red is bad, green is good. Um, so while our city services, you can see on the right side here are kind of up and running and we wanted to show that, you know, there's still construction going on. There's still um, services being delivered. People are still, we're still answering calls at 311, 18,000 calls last week alone. Um, in the middle, you can see where we're providing just a lot of services and support to people in need. And we also run all the testing for coronavirus in the city, um, <clears throat> which not all cities do. We were the first ones to offer that to anybody for free and the first to offer it for free to anybody, even if they were asymptomatic. Um, we've offered almost 3 million tests to date. And we are now, as uh, David mentioned earlier, in the midst of starting to roll out the vaccination as well. Uh, in, in coordination with our county public health services. But on the left-hand side, you can see our current numbers, which are quite chilling and, um, and heartbreaking as uh, we see a spike coming after the Thanksgiving holidays and after people were out and about more. And so um, this helps to kind of give a sense to people about what's going on and, uh, and where we are and, and what they can do. So in the midst of all of that sad news, we are still trying to move forward with the use of data for, for a wide variety of city services. And we use a, a whole bunch of different kinds of methodologies and technologies in trying to create these services uh, from predictive analytics, machine learning, blockchain. And in fact, we're even doing things with gamification and, and augmented reality. As part and parcel of all of this, we really have an embedded uh, com um, commitment to data privacy and the ethical use of data. And we've just drafted our first digital bill of rights and code of ethics, which we're about getting ready to publish this month, um, which helps to express our commitment to that and guidelines for departments and our partners on the ethical use of data and the understand, understanding the impl implicit bias that we all bring to the things that we do. An invitation for those of you who are interested in, in collaborating in some way is we have a, a whole way in which we organize contributions to our data science work at the city that come from outside the city. So while we have a lot of employees at the city, there are just a lot of people who are very smart who are not at the city of Los Angeles. And we want them to be able to be part of the voices that help to understand the data and bring those stories forward. So we have three different programs that we put together. One is our Data Science Federation, which partners with 18 universities in California and Arizona to look at how we can better um, analyze data and use data for equitable and insightful city policies. So city departments at cities all over uh, Southern California, actually we've opened this to other cities and many other cities participate now, come up with data challenges that they have on a specific actual city department. Um, and then we partner with universities on a course that's in progress. Uh, so it might be on Python or data visualization or data ethics or or even non-data science departments, like we have a lot of public art and we've done a lot of art projects too, data science into looking at art. And so the students get a chance with the professors to actually work on these projects. They're the actual work that gets done. We adopt most of the solutions that come out of these. We work hand in hand with our city departments as we move forward. And the interesting thing is that we, we have been able to hire about 10% of the students who come through this program. Um, they get a real taste for working in local government and the, the difference they can make. And we get a fresh set of eyes and perspectives and young ideas around how to um, deploy our city services better. More embedded, we actually are working and have done co-curriculum development with Cal State uh, Los Angeles. Um, so this is part of a four-year university degree and three years are focused in data science. And at the end of those, the capstone project, we uh, work with the students to place them in a nonprofit. So this is not city government, but the city government working with our local nonprofits that are advocating for things that are important, uh, whether that was some of the projects this summer included working with asthma and pollution, LGBTQ rights and effects of COVID on our elderly and seniors. Uh, there's about 35 different projects that happened this summer. And so it's a really great opportunity to get co-curriculum development that really leads to better data science and also connects to between the nonprofit and the government sectors. And our last way in which we bring in ideas that are fresh and new is our Data Angels project. Uh, so this is taking people who are actually data scientists or, or work with data normally in their jobs or in some way. And we kind of find out what they're interested in 
and connect them with a city project. We're doing one mapping black owned businesses in Los Angeles. We're doing another one on financial equity uh, for unbanked populations. We've done several on coronavirus, another one refreshing our inventory on our open data portal. And so this is a chance for folks who um, want to contribute a few hours a week or a day or two a month to be able to help um, connect. And so all of these give us different perspectives that help to broaden our view and, and help to have more voices at the table um, than just the ones that are used to kind of working inside City Hall. And just to point out, some of our data scientists are really young. <laughs> so one of our groups is Girls Who Code, but we also have ways of connecting to our youngest our youngest Angelinos. Um, this, the first picture up here shows a, a, one of our kids playing in a park. Uh, this is actually something you can still do <laughs> to be able to um, use augmented reality on our Southern California Explorer app that lets you go in and explore the wildlife and interact with mountain lions in the most safe way, which is through augmented reality. But to learn more about mountain lions and bobcats and deer and bears and all the other things that you don't really expect are in the city, but are all around us. Uh, our Octavia Lab here at our central library uh, does a whole variety of 3D modeling. We have a podcast studio for people to be able to come in and try out new technologies, fashion design and high tech, 3D printers, and a whole robotics course, as you can see here. We're really engaged, not just with our youth, but with all of our residents to try to find new ways to bring them into the discussion around science. So when we put all this together, we, we put the issues that were challenged with like coronavirus, and we put the opportunities to connect people into this, how do we then make sure that everybody understands the data and is that the data is made accessible to folks? So there's a few different programs that we're involved with that we uh, oversee. One is called Know Your Community. So this is sort of the most connected app to your local location. We work this and design this with our neighborhood councils. There's 99 neighborhood councils throughout Los Angeles. And what we do is we work with them to understand what are the challenges that the folks in your neighborhood are interested in. And so, for example, you can see on this map, people were interested in who their neighborhood council members are, what, where they could vote, um, aspects around um, building permits. They wanted to know what was planned in their community so that they could, you know, have a voice in whether or not they wanted to support or resist that development. Um, and then we also have a 311 app, which allows people to make requests and, and that's open data. So you, you won't know who made the request, but you will know that a request was made to fill that pothole or remove that graffiti, or there was a noise complaint. And so you can see what's, what's going on in your community, but you can also see if other people are concerned about the same sorts of things. And so this is a real simple interface that just maps that information in a way that you can see exactly what's happening like down to your block level. Another new program we have is called the Angelino program. And this is an integrated sign on to all city services. So we looked at this issue uh, with related to COVID and we realized we had to immediately in March move many of our city services virtual and as we did that, we needed to make sure we kept them contactless so they would be safe for folks. Um, sometimes this is a hybrid where you check out your books from the library online and then you pick them up at a curbside pickup. Other times they're completely uh, remote and contactless. So we've created a single sign-on to city services. We are moving hundreds of city services to an online capability and then behind that in order to pay for some of these city services, whether it's a license for your dog or a parking ticket, um, although a lot of that has been abated during COVID or a permit that um, we also realize that we are the third highest city for unbanked folks in the country. So that means that over 10% and in some demographics, 30% of our folks don't have access to regular bank accounts for a variety of reasons. So we've created actually a partnership with MasterCard to be able to provide that banking capability to folks and to kind of walk them through the financial literacy aspects. So when we started this idea it was really about a data-driven approach to better access to city services and all of the pieces we learned and with COVID happening have informed this into a much broader program that is really gonna be more inclusive to lots of folks. 
These are two of the examples of, of recent apps we've developed, the, the MyLA311 app, which handles uh, well over one and a half million requests a year from folks who go out to uh, take a picture of something that they wanna change in the city or something that, that's broken streetlight to be able to get it repaired right away. And of course, there's a call center behind it that supports over 140 languages. Our Shake Alert LA was the first in the country to provide early earthquake warning. And so this provides notice with a minute's warning that an earthquake has started and that you're about to feel shaking. This is a partnership with the US Geological Survey and is, uh, is used by over a million Angelinos. I'm just gonna to touch on this, which is our data mobility specification, just to say from a data science perspective that while we talk kind of broadly about many of these issues and, and I'll mention these kind of sweeping reforms that we're doing that we actually really get into the details because uh, you all know that anytime you're actually talking about data science, it's not just the concept, but it's making sure that the data is standardized in a way that is consumable that is rep uh, replicable and that is timely. So we created a data specification that has now been adopted by more than 50 other cities. And we've now uh, created a, an independent um, organization that manages this. Uh, this data specification was originally around the scooters that came into the city, the electronic scooters, and were just kind of getting dumped all over the place. So we worked with the companies and said, look, we're happy to provide permits for you to operate in the city of Los Angeles, but you know, today it's scooters, tomorrow it's autonomous vehicles, eventually it's a flying autonomous vehicles. We wanna make sure that we have data sharing specifications that let us know where these uh, scooters are, are end up and where they start so that we can do curb cutouts and make sure there's safe parking for the scooters um, and understand where we need to uh, make sure they're not blocking wheelchair access ramps. But at the same time, we wanna make sure we're rigorously protecting the privacy of the individuals using the service. So this has been a really helpful way of getting into the very detailed specifications around making sure that we share data responsibly, that we get data shared with us responsibly in a way that makes the city safer. Part of what we've uh, been working on for years, but um, many of you have realized is even more important now during COVID is digital literacy and access to the internet. And that's just not been something that a lot of folks in LA have every day. Some of our neighborhoods, 50% of households are disconnected. So we, we really dove into that data. We disaggregated it. There's FCC data, which we augmented with local data to understand on this map, as you can see, kind of by neighborhood, which neighborhoods are most digitally divided. And we've been working with our telecommunication companies for several years in building out more network capacity in those neighborhoods, which is not necessarily the most profitable model for them. So we've done quite a bit of, of work together to make that happen. Um, so there's now no place in Los Angeles that is not connected. Everybody has at least some access. And in most cases, at least two providers have provide access to those locations. We also put together a site and working with the telecom companies called Get Connected Los Angeles that puts together all of these uh, offers for low cost and no cost internet and devices and makes it accessible. It's so popular that our LA Unified School District also uses it as their their backup site and, uh, and it's just a great opportunity. We have a monthly forum with all these companies to make sure it's up to date. And we just launched last week our Angelina Connectivity Trust, which is providing 18,000 homeless and foster care students uh, free internet for five years. And so we are rolling out our first 3000 devices into the hands of students this week and next. So trying to get it there before the holidays and making sure that uh, all the kids who need to be connected stay connected during the school year. And as we look at that data, you'll see that this map and this map look hauntingly familiar in some parts of the city. Equity happens across um, the city and often in our most underserved and poorest neighborhoods. So part of what we do is we look also at issues around environmental justice and sustainability. Um, access to green spaces and trees and, and places to just uh, be able to kind of get out and relax a little bit are so essential and, and it's not equitable across the city. So as we looked at the areas where we wanted to make sure that we were um, making things better, we looked at areas where there was a lack of access to green trees 
and park spaces. And so these are areas where we are committed to uh, planting more trees. We have a partnership with an organization called City Plants. And last year we launched our LA's Green New Deal, which is an augmentation of our ongoing sustainability plan with over a hundred action items related to climate action and climate change. Uh, LA runs the largest municipal water and power district uh, in the country. And so we end the largest port in the Western hemisphere. Um, and we have LAX as our airport, all of those are city departments. And so we actually have the ability to have a pretty strong impact on uh, clean air and climate action in Los Angeles. And just a couple more points. One is a, a new program we've just started called Predicting What We Breathe. So this is a partnership with Cal State LA. It's a grant from NASA. Uh, and we work with our South Coast Air Quality Management Dis District and several of our um, healthcare providers. We're using machine learning and combining satellite data as well as data from all of our Internet of Things ground data sensors at the city. We have sensors at our libraries, at our landfills, on our sanitation trucks, on our streetlights. We have sensors all over the place. But we're integrating all this data in a way that helps us to get a better hyper-localized map of what's going on. And because the NASA data goes back so far in time in standard ways, we're actually able to do predictive analytics to understand what the air quality is today and what it might likely be in the next week or two and into the future. We're open sourcing this with other cities from around the world. Mayor Garcetti leads the C40 cities. Um, so we're working with uh, cities in all six in six continents. <laughs> And um, as part of this work, it's really helpful to us to be able to um, put together the data standards by which we're doing this machine learning, understand the training data sets, but more importantly, connect that into the people who will actually use the data, which is our Southern California Asthma Association, Anthem Blue Cross Healthcare, and Propeller Health, which um, runs uh, GPS devices for asthma sufferers. We also are using data in different ways. Again, we often look at external partnerships to help inform what we're doing. So we ran a COVID computational challenge uh, earlier this year. And this was trying to help to understand if there's a risk-based score for locations. So are some places like certain restaurants or certain malls or certain neighborhoods more risky than others for contracting COVID? And we looked at data, not just from the COVID case rates, but also issues around how many cars are driving in and out of that, mobility data, um, information about uh, traditional uh, numbers of people who would go to a specific point of interest there. So that helped us to understand areas that we wanted to place more testing facilities, where we wanted to make sure that we were focused on equity, uh, making sure that we understood um, where we needed to uh, align some of the information and awareness campaigns around COVID. And this has now helped to inform a much larger challenge, uh, which is the XPRIZE pandemic challenge, uh, which we've just started two weeks ago and is an, another global challenge, but this time with a $500,000 prize instead of a $5,000 prize. Um, that's gonna help to really expand this work and then link it to the policies that are most effective in helping people be as safe as possible. Part of what we've done as a city is do what a lot of other countries do, which is adopt the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And what this does is it helps give us a global framework for understanding how we're improving around equity, social justice, reduced inequalities, and improved health. And so even though as a city, we don't manage all of these things, like we just, you know, there's other parts of the government that manage some of these still feel that it's important to understand how the quality of life in LA is improving or not. Uh, so when you go to our site, you'll find that if you click on any one of these behind it, you'll find dozens of indicators for each, each of these um, aspects and the data sets actually that are part of this. Now, not all of that data is owned by the city. We, we partner with lots of others. So United Way provides us information about homelessness, um, we link to county and federal data as well where it's appropriate, but it helps to have a data-driven approach to what are we actually doing to improve gender equality and are we improving on our commitment to that. So that's some of what we're doing in Los Angeles around data science. I think it's really important that we think about things in the light of equity, 
that we think about them as diversity. So we wanna make sure that, that the teams that we have working on these around data science are teams that reflect the diversity of Los Angeles. So I'd be open to hearing your questions and, and your ideas. Hi, Jean, this is David. Uh, let me open my video. So thank you very much for that overview of all that's going on in the city of Los Angeles around data, which is much more than I anticipated. And, you know, you brought up um, a, a couple of things. I want to read the first question that's come in, and then I had some, some additional questions. We, we hear from one speaker, can you speak to how and when you use machine learning and how you hedge against al algorithmic bias in the work at the city? Sure, that's a really great question, Antonia. I appreciate that. Um, I think it's it's always a challenge, right? You don't understand your own bias all the time, right? And so things that may seem obvious are, are really not to, when you bring more voices to the table. So part of what we do is we just really bring in a diverse group of folks together to work on these uh, different ethnicities, socioeconomic backgrounds, different perspective, maybe different um, visions of what LA could be like. Um, and and so part of that then leads to things like our code of ethics for programming for ourselves and our vendors that that holds people helps people be aware of it. We're doing implicit bias training as well at the city. And then um, on that code of ethics, for example, we had a lot of outside organizations like the United Nations, uh, Data Ethics for All, um, Tech for Good, and the Sunlight Foundation come in to help look, and the Open Government Partnership come in to help look at those and make sure we're kind of holding ourselves accountable in the best possible way. When we look at machine learning specifically, I think part of it, the challenge becomes what you, like what data are you using? Is the data itself equitably obtained and collected and gathered and disaggregated? Um, and then sometimes, and then it's also your training data set, right? So we wanna make sure that not only the outcomes of what we're doing, but the data that we're using to train it is equitable. So for air quality, it's a little, a little easier in that it seems very scientific and it's very objective. But when we actually looked into this, for example, we realized that many of our sensors were, many of our communities of color and our poor communities were not, didn't have air quality sensors. So when we started looking at how good the air quality was, we were ignoring areas of the city where, where there might be a huge issue. We didn't know, but we, so now what we're doing is we're putting a citizen science component to it and we're letting people check out air quality sensors, purple air, air quality sensors from our libraries to take home and post so that those areas are better covered. I had a question, um, Jean, about some of the data that's behind the, um, the platform that's, uh, that shows what's going on in the city. And also basically, I'm wondering, is there information that the city has that is currently not public that the city is working to make public? And how are you dealing with um, privacy data? Great question. So we have lots of data that hasn't been made public. Sometimes that's because we don't think anyone's interested. Uh, sometimes it's because it was like a point in time data and we're not sure, Like. You know, maybe it was from two years ago and we're, it's not data we're going to continuously collect. Um, there's other data. So anybody can request a data set on the portal. Um, you can also tweet us <laughs> and we request a data set. Um, but uh, but for, let me give an example. So one of the things we wanted to talk about was use of force by LA Police Department. Um, and there had been some uh, content published on the web about that, but not in any kind of like data source specific area. So we've been working with them as part of our commitment to eight can't wait for those of you in, in the community know that that's a commitment to um, more transparency around use of force in police departments and the way, ways to avoid that by, by changing policies. So now you'll see on our open data portal, it's, it's one of those stories featured, the um, use of police, use of force by police 
In this case, there is some specific personal data that is identified as part of understanding the transparency around that. In most cases, we scrub and anonymize all the personal data. And we even think about like the mosaic effect. So we might release a data set from our animal services and about the number of adoptions of dogs. <laughs> and then we might release another data set around noise complaints from 311. And you could put, those, both of those are scrubbed and anonymized, but maybe there's a way to connect that that barking dog at that address happens to be Jean's barking dog. <laughs> uh -huh. And so, you know, it could, you could infer. So we think about things like that um, to help protect data privacy. But I think the challenge is always like, how are we going to provide more open data? And in which ways uh, is it gonna be most useful to folks? I work a lot with our chambers of commerce to try to understand from business perspective as well, what's gonna be useful for folks. Okay, and maybe a follow-up question on the, on the use of force then. I know across the country, uh, major cities uh, like Los Angeles are starting to, um, laws are being passed that are making more, uh, requesting more of the disciplinary records and other force information to be made um, public. And it seems some of the challenges that are being faced are a lot of the data is uh, handwritten uh, reports, um, um, video, maybe even some video. So that it comes in all forms and it's, it, it's um, highly unstructured. Are you doing much in that space where you have in the city where you have a lot of data sources that you can't um, do the analysis you want to do because of the form it's in and how are you approaching that? Yeah, so we do get data in lots of different forms. Um, we digitize a lot of our records, especially for the police department kind of right away. Um, if, the, if the officer is not in a place where he's doing a digital entry initially, right? Because sometimes they're in the field and that's true for a fire department when they're in the midst of a wildfire too. Sometimes it's not a digital entry. Um, we collect video data. All of our police for several years have worn body worn cameras that are always on. Um, that's 8,000 sworn, no sorry, nine, over 9,000 sworn officers. So it's a lot of video data. Um, in, and so much of that video data is, is never accessed. Like it's just, it's regular things that happen during the day, but obviously we want it on so that we can pull whenever an incident happens or whenever somebody reports an incident. And so we can access that video data. And so we both provide a transcription if there was a verbal aspect to it, but we also provide the video. Like you can go and see the videos uh, on our open data portal as well. Okay. And then, um, and in some cases we like, you may see like faces blurred if it was somebody who was just standing by because we want to, we appreciate people's need to be anonymous if they were just incidental to a, a crime scene or a, an incident scene. Um, and then the other thing is that we also get like drone footage during wildfires, right? We, we use a lot of drones to um, help us manage a wildfire incident. So we do get data in lots of different ways. Some of that ends up being just internal use, but a lot of it, we try to provide more and more of it onto our public portal. And we just did a whole inventory analysis with some of our data angels and cleaned up and kind of refreshed a lot of that data and did a few, a little more context around it as we were doing more of our stories. Thank you. Um, I, another question has come in from um, Haley hunter Zink. Can you give a sense of how long um, some of the example data science projects took from idea to implementation? And um, Haley also wanted to compliment your, your talk. Oh, thank you so much, Haley. Um, it varies a lot. Uh, when we started working on the digital divide map, that was something we wanted to do really quickly to kind of prove out to our telecommunication companies where we wanted them to focus some of their build out for 5G. Um, so that took a couple of weeks to kind of get a few iterations out and then to share with them and kind of iterate back and forth. Um, our, we just had a data angel who's actually with the LA Times, um, who was working with us to map black owned businesses. So, and this was a project that he did probably a few hours a week. Um, and so it, was an, it happened over about eight weeks, but it, it compressed, it would have been you know shorter, but we also had to, like, there's not a lot of explicit data. We had to go troll Yelp and look on Beyonce's site. And like, we had to go out and be really creative about where we were able to identify because this data didn't exist. It wasn't disaggregated. Like we knew minority businesses, but we didn't know specific black owned or Asian owned or native American owned businesses. Uh. 
that sounds like a challenge that I would not have thought of um, before. So, but if we think about the David, if we think about equity, right, and we're thinking about yeah. racial equity, particularly yeah. at this moment, um, especially with the, like the disproportionate impact on communities of color with COVID, and how many essential workers are in those areas, and, and the really high incidence rate, disproportionate incident rate we're seeing, particularly around our Hispanic communities. Is that you know we we need to disaggregate this data, but often right. we don't have it disaggregated. Yeah. So we have to figure out either like models or inferential data or some other way of, of starting to get to that, so we can understand um, you know how equitable we're being or not. Right. Absolutely, and I'm hoping perhaps some of the attendees today who are doing forward-looking uh, research may have some ideas that they would get back to you with and, and us um, at the six institutes. But let me get to um, more questions are, are coming in. Um, you may appreciate this question from an anonymous attendee who's seeking advice for students. What advice would you give to current students interested in pursuing careers in data science for urban governance? I think that is an amazing choice of career. There is so much potential and there is so much hunger in both local governments and the federal government to be able to uh, do data science. Um, before I came to the city, uh, one of the other things I did was I was at NASA for 32 years as the chief knowledge architect and um, I'd come out as a, as a student myself from UCLA. Uh, and started as a, as an unpaid student. I think a lot of us started careers that way. Uh, and so part of the challenge is that whether you're at the federal level or whether you're at local government, there's this ongoing understanding that we need more data insights to create more equitable and better policies and programs. Um, I think it, it's an important time for data scientists and scientists of all kinds to kind of step forward and be part of that brave uh, cadre of folks in the government. I think it's an interesting time where there's been a backlash against science in many cases and a disbelief in many things that are happening around us. And while I am compassionate to people's need to kind of discover and be curious and contest and argue. And I think that's all great in our society. I think there are moments when it's really important for folks who can help dig into the data to be able to be part of a government that can better support their citizens and their residents. Um, it's an amazing opportunity right now. If you're interested um, in connecting uh, with me directly, I'll, I'll post my email in the chat. I would love to connect with uh, anyone who's interested in you know, participating or just exploring it further. Thank you. Um, we have another question from a, a graduate student seeking a master's in information. And, and you talked about the data angels, but um, as a way to get involved, but she's interested in using her data science for public good and, and wanted maybe other advice of ways to get involved. Um, there's lots, there's a couple of, so there's different programs in addition to the one we're talking about, although we'd love to have you as a data angel. Um, there's programs with Code for America, which are in almost every urban space and a lot of rural spaces in the country, which is a great program to get connected and, and most often is connected to the local government organization as well. Um, there's also uh, the US Digital Response Team, which is a bunch of us Obama alum. Um, when, I spent six years at the White House uh, as the architect behind data.gov. And so a lot of those folks have gone on to create this, um, this service that connects with local governments and state governments to help, especially now during the pandemic, but even before, to help come up with creative ideas around data science and technology and innovation to help local governments. So there's a couple of different ways to uh, connect. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's Metro Lab, which is kind of like our data science federation for some other cities as well. So there's, there's lots of ways, it would be great. Okay, and then um, th this question has a preface, so uh, I'll read it all from Boris, Fabian, Jesse. Assuming that the economic and cultural diversity of LA is deep and that spatial areas like neighborhoods present spatial barriers to educational services and interaction, what are the long-term or permanent developments in online virtual city spaces for education or for other services? 
That's a great question. So I think uh, I think we have seen a huge transformation in our ability to understand online education. I, I think a lot of us have taught I know hybrid courses over the years are completely online or completely on the ground courses. It's been really um, helpful, but it's always been slightly exclusive. Um, and and part of the work, that's why I get so in, intrigued and, and involved in our work on the digital divide, because if we don't give people access to these online spaces, because they don't even have internet access or device, then it doesn't, it's not useful. So when we think about this idea of virtual city spaces, there's a couple of things. There's one aspect of making sure people can access data and city services, kind of little old school. I mean, maybe it's slightly new school, but it's a little old school. And the second aspect is sort of the idea of an online urban sim city kind of thing. So where we're able to provide models, um, which is partly what we're doing around air quality with NASA, uh, climate models, where we're able to provide uh, city planning so that people are able to see what's happening, like physically going to be happening in their neighborhoods, um, and being able to let people kind of co-develop and, and co-understand what those spaces are so that they can apply their own al algorithms and their own models on top of that. So I think that's an evolving area where it gets involved in geospatial data, it gets involved in modeling, um, algorithm development. I mean, if you ask um, climatologists, for example, uh, you know, what is the model for how we, we understand climate? There's a lot of models, right? Because everybody has a slightly different interpretation of, of you know, how, what effect there is of different aspects into the model, including human behavior. So I think it's important for people to have as much, for us as a city, to provide as much transparency and access to all of that information so people can kind of pull it apart and say, ah, but this piece, I have a different interpretation and be able to insert their understanding. Well, thank you, Jean. I'm wondering if you have um, any potting comments for our audience today. And I thank you for um, all you've all you've shared about what's going on in, in Los Angeles. It is certainly applicable to other cities as well. Sure. So I posted some of the links in the chat. And if you are sharing my uh, slides later, which you're welcome to, they have links embedded in them as well. Um, and I also posted my email in case people want to follow up. I, I would just like to say, kind of from a perspective of like, as a data scientist. So let me kind of put aside the other stuff we've been talking about and talk more like our, our um, you know, sort of our field is that it's really important to provide um, the ability for lots of different kinds of voices to come, to come to the table. And I know I've said this before, but I think it's important to reiterate is a data science team should reflect, especially from the government's perspective, the people it's trying to serve. So we, we see a lot of stuff coming out of Silicon Valley. I'm going to go ahead and pick on my other California city here. <laughs> we see a lot of stuff sometimes coming out of places like Silicon Valley and also probably Los Angeles, where you have a team that is very uh, homogenous. It's all, they're all very people who are very much alike. It could be any demographic. Often it's young white men, but it could be anybody. And, and they often design towards what they see, the way they see the world. And we saw this happen recently at Facebook around the algorithm for being able to do facial recognition um, to be able to help um, identify people in photos. And when it was opened up to the public for beta tests, what we found was that people of color, especially people who were particularly dark skinned, were not even identified as people sometimes because the training data set had been a lot of young white men. And so when we think about, like if you had a more diverse team, it is likely that they would have seen that as a bias within the training data. So the more kinds of diversity that you have on your team or the ways that you connect to people who are more diverse to help test some of your hypotheses, I think is important. And it's really important to also bring more voices to the table. So, you know, as a, as a leader and a manager, I always do use a plus one rule. And I would just encourage everybody to think about this. So wherever you are in whatever level of the organization or whatever group you're working with, try to include more people. So bring somebody along to a meeting who maybe isn't invited, <laughs> but you wanna give them a chance to kind of have a little exposure or be able to be there. It's not always comfortable because sometimes, you know, it's, it's a meeting with, other known people, but by bringing somebody else to the table, another voice, another perspective, a younger person, it does give a lot of opportunity for that person then to think differently, to grow, to become curious, and to bring a diverse set of um, 
ideas forward. So, you know, we are all in this together. It's rough times for our country. COVID is surging. The economy is struggling. People are struggling. And our work as data scientists and data advocates is so important to how we can change the world. And we all have the opportunity to, to be part of that. And I would just invite you to reach out to your local government, reach out to us and be part of that change. Thank you so much, Jean. I'm glad you offered those closing comments um, and hope the, I'll take them to heart and hope the others joining us today will do the same. Thank you very much for um, ending our, uh, our first series of Data Science Coast to Coast um, talks. We really appreciate it. And thank you all who joined today. Thanks, stay safe, everybody. Bye now.